Welcome to Wicked Shizuku's Reviews, bringing you a southern perspective on books, movies, music, and much, much more. Stick around for a while, you just might hear something wicked. And hello again. This is episode 52 of Wicked Shizuku's Reviews and a Tuesday read. So if you're new here, please rewind back into the playlist and you will be able to partake in these reads from the very beginning. And as uh, I've said in previous episodes, I'm on this journey of reading 22 new reads with everyone from page one and the season won't be over until the last page is read. So this episode I'm going to be continuing with the book of Brave Deeds and I'm kind of excited to go into this story. It's called A Deed of Daring Do. A Deed of Daring Do from Brave Men in Action by Stephen J. McKenna. When William of Orange in 1690 bro broke up in disgust from the first siege of Limerick and sulkily retired to England, he left a military legacy to General Grinkle, which that astute Dutchman scarcely cared to accept. In the previous year, even while the Boyne was yet gorged with the corpses of those slain in the great battle on its banks. General Douglas, with five cavalry and twelve infantry regiments and some artillery of William's army, had set down before Athlone, never doubting that the stronghold, which is said even to this day to command Ireland, would fall into his hands as an easy prey. The town divided into Irish and English portions respectively situated on the west and east shores of the Shannon was held for King James by old Council Colonel Grace, as staunch a soldier perhaps as ever buckled on a sword and spurs, who seeing that the English side was untenable, at once burned that quarter to the ground. Previous to retiring into Irish, to the Irish one, and further strengthened his position by breaking down one of the arches of the bridge which Sir Philip Sidney had built in the days of Queen Elizabeth. The event proved that Colonel Grace's soldiership, which was at first much blamed even by his own party, was quite correct, for General Douglas was completely baffled in his efforts to take the place and after a siege of seven days, had to be a retreat which was so pre precipitate as to almost deserve the name of a flight. Naturally, King William was extremely annoyed at this repulse, and he was still more chagrined at the military fault he had himself committed in attempting to take Limerick, while Alphonse still controlled nearly the whole of the west of Ireland on behalf of his rival. While the complete failure of his efforts to dislodge the French and Irish from the first-named city brought up his anger to a boiling point. Therefore, previous to his departure for England, he had laid it on General Grinkle as a solemn duty that Athlone Athlon must be taken in the course of the next year's campaign, and the sturdy Hollander, loath though he was, had no option but to move on that fortress in the mouth of June 1691. Advancing from Ballymore, which he captured with some difficulty, and hanging 
the little garrison when it fell as his brutal testimony to the bravery of their de defense. Grinkle found that the England English town had again been pre had been occupied, half ruined though it was since Grace had burned it, and that, in fact, the whole place had been made much stronger than it was when it succeeded in beating off Douglas in the previous year. The garrison, too, was considerably greater now than had been the case then, for a large portion of the best Irish irregular troops released from Limerick were in and all around it the new French general, St. Ruth, with a capitally equipped army of 5,000 horse and 25,000 foot lay within a couple of miles of the Irish town on the western bank of the river. Large stores of ammunition and food had been accumulated. The fortifications had been restored where they had formerly suffered. Formidable outworks had been added at every available point, and General Grinkle felt that to capture Athlone in its present excellent condition was indeed a feat which could not be accomplished without exceeding difficulty and at very large leaven of luck. Nevertheless, he obeyed his master's orders, but he went about the work with a leisurely care which the French and Irish declared to be cowardice, but which really was nothing but a simple a sample of that master, masterly in, inactivity which had often gained victories when greater bustle and energy might have lost them. His choice of position was a matter of considerable deliberation, and even when he had made his decision, he took no st step whatever in advance until he had fully entrenched what he held and had thus secured himself on all sides. He had plenty of siege artillery, able engineers, a fine corps of sappers and miners, and there were with him a number of officers of what were even then the scientific arms of the service, who had taken active part in some of the greatest sieges during the continental wars of the period. When occupied in making his dispositions, and they took a considerable time to accomplish, Grinkle was pleased to learn from his spies that St. Ruth affected to despise him that instead of looking to his fortifications, the due training of his troops, the French general had given himself over to gaiety and disp disp dissipation. And that, best of all, he was leading the Irish officers, to a certain extent, into similar courses. There was nothing, as he said himself, that General Grinkle liked better than being despised by a military opponent in the field. For then the wily old fellow knew the chances were strong, strongly in favor of his own ultimate triumph. The first task set to the Orange Army was the reduction of the reoccupied English eastern town, and that was not difficult of, an, of accomplishment. When the strength and weight of Grinkle's artillery are taken into consideration. He bombarded it from a safe distance. His showers of heavy cannonballs in a few days tumbled the whole place into a mass of indistinguishable ruins, and his infantry moved to assault it in full confidence that the Irish, under the command of Colonel Fitzgerald, would fly before them at the first sound of their trumpets and drums, and that that they were quite mistaken. The native soldiery fought like Grecian heroes of old, and it was not until the smoking ruins were literally piled up with their dead, and with Grinkles too, that they made an orderly retreat across the Shannon, leaving the Dutchmen in profound grief 
for the loss of a vast number of his best troops, whose lives might readily have been spared had he only continued the bombardment until not an archway should be left to cover an Irish head. However, he was not a man to cry long over spilt milk, and he set at once to work to improve the position he had dearly won. Unfortunately for Grinkle, old Colonel Grace, whose military acuteness had been again vindicated by ex the expulsion of the Irish from the eastern portion of the Afwon, had been wise enough in his generation to break down the very furthest or most western arch of the bridge across the Shannon, so that the greater portion of that structure, while nominally in Grinkle's possession, was really but a sort of trap along which his men were constantly, uselessly exposing their lives and losing them under the Irish fire. To obviate this practice, which he could not well forbid without lessening the rivalry of courage in his troops, Grinkle planted at his end of the long causeway a strong battery armed with half a dozen mortars and the same number of heavy guns. Behind that, and on either flank, he erected others at an increased elevation, until the whole of his formidable attack bore some distant resemblance to a gigantic flight of stairs, commencing almost level with the flower, flowing water and culminating on the highest point of the shattered debris of the English town in his possession. At first, all these guns, whose position has been thus plainly detailed for the better understanding of the daring deed that has be to be recounted, were trained to sweep the, bri the bridge and so hammer all together on the castle on the Irish side overlooking it. And a second tremendous bombardment with only the breadth of the river between the muzzles of the guns and their stern old target was forthwith commenced. The fire thus concentrated on one point soon began to make itself felt, and though it was vigorously replied to by the Irish, the vast superiority of the metal with which Grinkle's batteries, seven in number, were armed, was not to be mastered or even sensibly reduced and the castle fell by degrees into complete ruins. Nor was the great artillery contest carried on merely by day. Night found the guns still thundering away, and the whole country round was still lit up by the ceaseless flashes, while the roar could be heard many a long mile away. The castle at last reduced Grinkle's bombardment was by degrees expanded so as to embrace the whole of the opposing town, and in due time that also seemed to crumble away under the deluge of shock, until at last there was scarce a vestige of a complete building left standing. The walls, which were very old of massive proportions, and the sturdiest strength, still preserved something of their former appearance, but they also did so by being constantly repaired by the Irish masons, who fell in hundreds while engaged in their work, but as fast as they were slain, others ran forward to climb up and take their places with a devoted courage which has never been surpassed and seldom even equaled in the annals of defensive operations. Untimely, however, the walls yielded under the ceaselessly terrific fire from the splendidly served batteries of the Dutch general, and at last there was, practically speaking, no town of Athlon left, and Grinkle found himself in the unpleasant position of having utterly destroyed a fortress without capturing it, or being master of a place which he was powerless to enter, because the bright Shannon still flowed calmly 
defiant between his army and the forces of the Irish and French on the other side. He found himself quite unable to advance. To retreat would be a humiliation. His king would never permit or condone. What was to be done? Nor was that dilemma the worst of the case, for the provisions of the English were running very short. Already the men were half on half rations. The supplies from the country had failed altogether, and the communications with Dublin, the only source from whence could be obtained food, stores, and ammunition, which latter also was failing, were cut off by the clouds of Irish light horse, who completely surrounded Grinkle up to the river's bank and waged on him a most harassing and distressing distressing guerrilla warfare which was carried on with almost entire impunity at this juncture one of the german engineer officers of grinkle's staff bethought him of a device he had seen successfully employed at a siege in the low countries and on being submitted to a council of war it was resolved to give it a, a trial at athlone It will be remembered that Queen Elizabeth's bridge, on which the Irish had not fired for obvious reasons, was still intact, save at the arch which Colonel Grace had destroyed, the arch closest to the western or Irish shore. And the Germans' plan was to push forward along the bridge, and under a heavy fire from all the guns, a strong force which concealed means of spanning the gap so that the Williamite troopers might be enabled only partially successful and for more reasons than one. First, they had not taken with them proper tools for the task. Second, the timbers were of ponderous weight and strength and had been securely clamped with irons and bound with massive chains. Third, the foothold for operations was exceeding limit, limit, limited, and last, the enemy's batteries once more directed every muzzle on that one spot, and maintained such an accurate fire as sent hundreds of the gallant Irishmen to find their death in the water below. Grinkle was furious at the retreat of his column. He stamped and swore with all the vigor and volubility of another Ernolphus, and he ordered four of the principal officers of the party into close arrest until such a time such time as a court martial could sit to punish their poltoonery. But valuable moments were slipping by and there was still a decent prospect of success were prompt measures taken. So mastering his rage, he reformed the column, added another of equal strength to follow it in support, and advanced it on the causeway with the ominous observation, which was speedily passed through the entire ranks of the expedition, that, if it wavered again, their own, the English, batteries should play on it, and leave not a man of them alive. The Irish, from the Connaught shore, saw this double column advancing without much trepidation, for they were now able to train a number of large guns on its head and flank, their sharpshooters along the ruins lining the river banks, above and below. What had been the town were enabled to open a deliberate fire from their safe nooks of vantage. Their repaired breastwork, manned with determined warriors from Maxwell's regiment of dragoons, of course dismounted, was still a very efficient temporary fortification, and best of all, there was not a vestige of cross planking now left on a few main beams still spanning the broken arch. 
so that the William Knights, who might venture to crawl across those naked timbers, would only do so to meet an immediate death by the sword, bullet, or in the deep waters flowing underneath. Still the column, covered by a pitiless fire from all Grinkle's batteries, and dropping its men by whole platoons into the Shannon, continued to press forward. Their grenaders threw their flaming missiles into and on the dry wattle breastwork with a persistence which at length ended in a similar conflagration to that of the previous afternoon, and the wind still holding in the same quarter as before the smoke and flames forced the Irish, who were falling in great numbers back into the ruins of the castle whether they would or not. Suddenly, and to the great consternation of the defenders, and attacking, the attacking column opened at its head and divided into two parts, down to its very center, whence, with a great cheer, the English rapidly pushed forward a wooden gallery in the nature of a drawbridge on upright hinges, which had been constructed by the German engineer, and this machine was at once run forward on wheels to the very edge of the broken arch, arrived there the supporting chains which held this novel gangway upright on its platform were let go. The machine dropped on the beams laid the previous night, and there was a safe and convenient substitute for the arch uniting once more the bridge and the Irish town of Afwang. An horrific, an horrific cry of fury and disappointed rage burst from the powder-blackened mouths of the baffled Irish, who had never once dreamed of the possibility of such a contrivance as this gangway being concealed in the center of their enemy's column, and it instantly became apparent to every one that the place was not unless that gallery could be destroyed, for already the English gang grenaders were securing it in position, laying down additional planking and preparing it to receive the head of their columns now masked at its very foot. For a single moment there was a pause, a fearful pause on that Sunday morning in the pleasant summer time. And then the Irish gunners and infantry recovered themselves, poured in the hottest fire that they, they had yet achieved, and literal, literally filled the waterway under the bridge with the corpses of Grinkle's men. So fast, however, as the latter fell, so fast did others pour on the causeway from the English side, and there could be no doubt that the Dutchman had made up his mind to set foot in Connaught that day, though it cost him half his army. There was but one hope for the Irish, the immediate destruction of the fatal gallery, gallery of communication. A sergeant in Maxwell's dra Dragoons, Costum Cust by name, grasped the situation at a glance and cried aloud as he stepped out from the huddled ranks of his comrades in words that Irish history will never cease to preserve. Are there ten men here who will die with me for Ireland? Not a second's pause now. There were not ten, but hundreds upon hundreds, and from amongst the strongest and most active of them, the devoted sergeant picked out the number he had stated. All of them were in the full armor of their core back piece and front piece of wrought steel thigh pieces that stood out over the knee as well, and great jack boots of horsehide, stout enough to ward off most bullets and to resist any saber slash the arm of a man of man could deliver. 
Fling aside your swords, men. Tis axes we want, was the sergeant's next order. Immediately he was obeyed, for there were plenty of tools all around. And then, with the simple words, Follow me, boys, for Ireland. Costumi, or costume, ran up to the inside of the Irish breastwork, climbed over it with the agility of a cat, and landed on the other side face to face with the English, was closely followed by his sacrificial tin, and forthwith all set to work to hew away the gallery, to wrench up and fling into the river planks just laid down, to destroy the dire machine, designed to destroy themselves, their comrades, and their cause. Grinkle's troops were absolutely stuck, struck dumb and motionless with profound astonishment at a deed of daring such as they had never witnessed before and one being done under their very noses even the gunners on the eastern shore ceased from their dear their deadly work in blank amazement and contemporary history tells us that for a brief space there was an ent entire silence that not a single sound could be heard in the stillness of the summer morning not a sound, save the chopping, ripping, and wrenching of the hammer-headed axes, mightily working in the sinewy hands of the eleven, whose immediate death was at, as certain as sunset. Then the English suddenly woke from their stupor, but not before the excellent progress had been made by Costoon and his heroic little knot of patriots. The batteries belched forth again, musket, pistol, and granado recompensed, recommenced their fearful work, and in five minutes the glorious leader and every one of his followers were floating dead in the Shannon, but surrounded with the planks, boards, and railings they had torn from the gallery ere they died. The same moment that the last of them toppled over sh the same moment that the last of them toppled over struck to death by a bullet and fell into the wild waves of the shannon again went up the hoarse cry from another sergeant in maxwell's ranks are there ten men who will die with me for ireland ten ten hundred if need be but if there was no room no more than the specified number to efficiently work at cutting away the gallery and immediately a second eleven equipped as had been their self-sacrificing predecessors clambered over the breastwork and took up the task which grim death had forced their comrades to abandon fast flew shot shell great bullets and granados from the english whizzing bursting and ripping up the woodwork all around the Irish eleven. But more fast went the axes in their hands. Faster went plank after plank over the side. Faster and yet faster did the gallery appear, disappear, until at length not a vestige of it save its wheeled platform on the English side remained. And there was no longer any foothold for attack but the naked beams just as useless as they had been in the morning. An exultant scream of triumph went up from the Irish soldiers crowding every ruin in the town to see this desperate venture performed. And the air rang again, even momentarily mastering the roar of the cannon. With their, with their wild applause, with their wilder calls to the heroes, of this second scene in the terrible tragedy to return ere it was too late. Too late? Too late indeed. For already nine of them were floating dead amidst the wreck below, and only two were able to spring back as they cut the last support of the gallery adrift to reclamber over the breastwork and to fall into their comrades' arms on the other side, faint indeed to absolute unconsciousness.
but alive, and bearing no wounds of a mortal nature. The English columns, positively appalled by such a deed of heroic devotion, and unable to fire another musket shot or fling another granado in their mute astonishment, were immediately recalled from their now perilous position by Grinkle himself. And as they retired along the causeway, the, the Irish volleys broke out afresh with fearful vigor, and the retreating troops fell in whole masses into the river, dead when they dropped, or to die in its cold embrace. For the heavy burden of their accoutrements contained the death warrants of all who once went over. Athlon was saved a second time, and though the English eventually captured it, chiefly owing to the absurd conflicts which St. Ruth and the Irish commanding officers, they never made the slightest impression by the way of the bridge which the twenty Irish heroes died in defending, and the only used and only used the causeway as a supplement when they had already gained a footing in Connaught by other means. And that was our brave deed of daring do. And the next time I visit the Book of Brave Deeds, we shall be covering the story of Sir William Wallace. So I hope you really look, in, look forward to that story. And if you enjoyed this, if you found it educational or entertaining, would you please give me a like, subscribe, and a share? And if you have any questions, you can put them down into the comment box below, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Sleep well. Pleasant dreams.